Time now for our industry panel to tackle some of the issues regarding thoroughbred aftercare. I'm joined by Dr. Atushi Kikuta from the Japanese Racing uh, Association, JRA, of course, sponsoring the IFR conference. Natasha Rose from the Hong Kong Jockey Club, Dr. David Craig from the Emirates Racing Authority, Melissa Ware from Racing Victoria, and Tim Gilbert, uh, broadcaster extraordinaire, joins us up the end. Please make them all welcome. Natasha, I'm going to start with you, and you do have the microphone. A great contingent here from Hong Kong. I heard Winfried Engelbeck Brescia's on radio in Melbourne this morning, so it's fantastic to see so many people here uh, for the Asian Racing Conference, but obviously here for IFAR as well. And it's a very unique model you have in Hong Kong, obviously, as far as you know, the funding, uh, money owners are required to pay in advance of their horses actually retiring. Tell us a bit about that model. Yeah, that's right, Caroline. Um, we do have quite a unique model in that when an owner brings a horse into Hong Kong, so we don't have a breeding industry, you know, horses are imported into our jurisdiction. So when they bring a horse into Hong Kong, they're required to put a lump sum of money um, into what I suppose we refer to as a retirement pot, for want of a better phrase. And that's at the very start of the horse's racing career before it's even stepped foot on the track. And at the moment, that stands at 100,000 Hong Kong dollars. So it's quite a sizable pot of money. Um, then that horse, of course, hopefully has a nice, long, successful career. We hold on to that money while they're racing. And then when that horse retires, the owner has two options. So option one, they either export the horse out of Hong Kong, and therefore they get that money back, and that goes towards the costs of you know, transitioning that horse out of the country and into its second career. Or they can choose actually to relinquish their ownership over to the club, and then it comes under our retraining program. And if they do that, then we keep the money, and that goes to help funding and support our program. So it's incredibly important, A, that we have a program like that in Hong Kong, um, our equestrian industry is heavily reliant on our retra retrained thoroughbreds. In fact, one of our riding schools, the riding school population could be made up of 77% of retrained thoroughbreds. They're teaching people to ride, which is a unique model in itself. Mm -hmm. But kind of going back to the funding and the reason why we ask for that up front is it, it puts the importance of aftercare and it puts the importance of retirement you know, at the start of the horse's journey. So it's in owners' minds. And and then aftercare doesn't become an afterthought at that point that that horse retires. Mm. And we do think that works very well and, and is probably uh, one of the uni unique aspects that we have in Hong Kong. Yeah, we know, I've said a lot in Australia and New Zealand, a lot of horses coming back from Hong Kong, which is fantastic. But obviously being such an urban sort of a, an environment in Hong Kong, how important is, is global collaboration to Hong Kong's retired horse uh, program? It's incredibly important. Um, I mean, we, in the Hong Kong Jockey Club, we run riding schools, as I mentioned, um, and we've got a lot of programs for our youth team and elite team. So thoroughbreds are very important to us. But Caroline, as you mentioned, and as everyone knows, you know, we're geographically constrained. Um, so we are relying on global collaboration. And, you know, the topic of today is about industry cooperation. Um, it's actually a shame that New Zealand, sadly, didn't make it to the panel with their cancelled flights because Alice and I were going to talk about a new project. We're we're actually in kind of the final stages of forming an official formal partnership with New Zealand Thoroughbred Racing um, and signing on the dotted line when we get to that point to actually support one another purely in aftercare. So together we're going to work on tracking and traceability, we're going to work on welfare, we're going to work on promoting the desirability of a racehorse in second careers. And we think this potentially has, you know, the opportunity to be an industry first where two major racing jurisdictions have actually formed a formal partnership to work together on that. So we hope it sets a blueprint potentially for the industry. We hope it sets the bar, for, especially for, for countries that operate like Hong Kong, where we, we can't keep our, all our horses in one country. And, you know, as we know, racehorses during their career are globetrotters, but increasingly after their racing career are globetrotters. So we at the Jockey Club want to do the moral thing, you know, for a horse that's contributed to our industry, we want to make sure as, as practically as far as possible we can safeguard their lives post-racing and we can only do that to the best of our ability by global collaboration. So no matter where the horse was bred, of course then raced in Hong Kong, but wherever it retires to, we're going to be reaching out to all of our industry partners in terms of global partners and hopefully, you know, with this, the partnership with New Zealand goes well and we'll replicate that across the world. 
Oh, it's fantastic. Some great work being done there in Hong Kong. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kikuta, we're going to ask you, have a little bit of a, a language barrier here, but uh, we will ask you with the help of a uh, translator, what is being done currently in Japan in relation to retired racehorses? Um, thank you, Caroline. And I first uh, thank you for giving me uh, this great opportunity to speak here. Um, in Japan, to be honest, uh, we were not so serious about the aftercare of uh, retail racehorses for a long, long time. Um, but um, in 2017, um, when I first activity uh, started to be very active, we also established a committee, a Japanese consultative committee on aftercare of retail racehorses. Um, the uh, member of this committee are gathering from racing industry, uh, uh, including horse owners, trainers, jockeys, and breeders, and racing authorities, and also uh, our regulatory body, uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Forest and Fisheries. Uh, the aim of this committee is to uh, investigate uh, the uh, current uh, the circumstances of aftercare of retired race horses and uh, construct and enforce uh, the activity that are proper, uh, appropriate for uh, Japan. Uh, this activity include uh, pro promoting the transition of the retired race horses to the second carrier. Um, for example, uh, RRC, uh, Retired Race Horse Cup, uh, uh, the competition uh, for just for retired race horses, and uh, supporting the uh, activity uh, of uh, university Extreme team that utilize many, many race horses, retired race horses in Japan, and enforce, enforcing the environment of their uh, post-retirement life. And what are some of the expected actions that you're looking to enhance in the future in Japan concerning retired racehorses? Thank you. Um, right now, uh, uh, there are two things uh, we are promoting, uh, we are trying to promote. One is uh, horse owners' uh, movement uh, to raise funds uh, to support the activity related to uh, retired horse and um, after care of retired uh, race horses and uh, this plan has been uh, in place and uh, not individual horse owners but horse owners association uh, will uh, put together uh, a system to provide money uh, to uh, support uh, these activities uh, 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 of um, aftercare of uh, retired race horses. And previously, uh, racing authorities, uh, we, J Japan Racing Association, were mainly uh, responsible for funding. But from now on, uh, each individual uh, racing community, horse racing community, will be participating in these actions. We think so. And uh, secondly, uh, we have a plan uh, to build a new uh, temporary stay facility for retired racehorses. Uh, it has been long recognized uh, it is necessary for retired racehorses uh, to stay and spend time uh, temporarily uh, to rest and to receive a uh, retraining program after retired from racing career. And uh, we are going to uh, build these facilities next year in 2024. The aftercare of uh, retired race horses is an issue uh, becoming uh, very uh, acknowledged uh, of very uh, importance by uh, our regulatory body, uh, Ministry of Agriculture and uh, Forestry and Fisheries, and we Japan Racing Association also recognize it is very, very important for us to continue to move forward steadily, step by step. Thank you. 
Thank you. Yes, as you said, from, from not a lot being done from a, a JRA point or a Japanese racing point of view, there's a lot being done now. So that is really fabulous to hear. And again, we thank the, the JRA for supporting this conference here today. And thank you, Dr. Kikuta. Looking at Australia, Mel, we'll get to you next, of course, uh, at Racing Victoria here in Melbourne. And, you know, you've, you have uh, a model sort of based, you know, part of it is about thoroughbred retrainers being accredited and, and then sort of checked up on and some programs for horses that traditionally may not have been able to find homes such as retired broodmares but what do you think you do well here your jurisdiction does well here and why thanks caroline um exactly what you said we have uh, over 50 acknowledged retrainers all across the state collectively they they retrain over 600 uh, retired Victorian racehorses each year into all different types of disciplines. So everything from dressage to showing to show jumping. Uh, we saw this morning at Spring Creek Equine, it was a wonderful example of um, uh, some of our leading acknowledged retrainers. And part of that is also our reset program, which is about uh, horses that have, may have struggled to find their perfect home. They just need a little bit more TLC and a little bit more support. And that's where Racing Victoria's funded retraining kicks in. And um, the horses are, are sent to people like Sam and Chris just for uh, up to three or four or five months worth of retraining, just to give them that little bit more extra time and, and that support that they need. So. The, between the retrainers and the reset program, we find that a lot, a lot of horses are really finding um, their best career pathways. Alternatively to that, we also have a really strong non-competitive program. So we recognise that not every horse is going to get to the Olympics or compete in the Gary Owen. And so we have really strong partnerships with Riding for the Disabled in Victoria, where we rehome horses to the RDA. And we also run a grants program for uh, equine businesses. And that's all about providing support for local uh, Victorian equine businesses who take on retired thoroughbreds into non-competitive homes. So we see the likes of um, riding schools, uh, and I see Lisa Coffey in the audience, and she has been one of the recipients for this program uh, with her um, Racing Hearts and, and the equine therapy program that she has. Uh, and so, yeah, so we really want to cover off competitive and non-competitive horses going into their second careers. Mm. Oh, it's great work. And every jurisdiction is obviously always looking ahead. So what, what's sort of next in your, your planning framework or, you know, the, the pipeline for aftercare here in Victoria? So last year we released our new five-year equine welfare strategic plan and we have a number of key focus areas. Although we've always worked on those areas, we really want to focus in on uh, the likes of... Uh, breeding, behavioural and physical welfare. Um, we have people like Andrew McLean, who's on our Equine Welfare Advisory Council, and Denise as well. And so they provide us guidance on really those new key focus areas and how we can work on those. Some of the projects that we've got um, teed up are acknowledge retirement farms, more support and education for ed uh, off the track riders through a grants program, and working on that behavioural uh, interactions piece um, and positive human interaction that, that Andrew was speaking about. Oh, some fantastic work being done here. So thank you very much, Mel. And uh, Latoya James, thrown in the deep end a little bit here. Unfortunately, Alice wasn't able to get here um, and she's unwell. But the executive officer of Equimillion, which is a, a new uh, competition, a, a really interesting um, sort of competition and auction that Racing New South Wales is developing. But first of all, just, just tell us about Team Thoroughbred and its function within New South Wales. Yeah, thank you, Caroline. And great to be here last minute. Uh, I guess Team Thoroughbred is the equine welfare retraining and rehoming program. It currently operates out of six properties or six locations. Four of them have been purchased by Racing New South Wales. As part of that, we have oversight of horses that enter that program. Essentially, the satellite retrainers, they're also part of the whole concept for Racing New South Wales. It's under the obligations that owners must find suitable homes once their horse retires from racing. And the vast majority of people in New South Wales are finding those homes. And for us at Team Thoroughbred, we're assisting those horses who are stuck. There are horses that aren't transitioning super quickly into equestrian sport or pleasure homes. And so we're able to take them in and assess them across the properties. The properties allow us to give the horses enough time to be a horse, take the time they need. We hire, we've got about a team of 20 staff who work full time within the welfare program and just ensure that we can get to know the animal and also help with their retraining and rehoming. 
One of the key things for us is really knowing who our buyers are. You know, where are these horses going? Are we able to provide extra support? Once a horse is ready to be rehomed, our head trainers and our retrainers will work with our buyers. We'll get to know the buyer's wants, their needs. What do they want to be doing with that particular horse? And see if they're actually a perfect match. Half the time, you know, a person might be buying a horse and the horse isn't the right fit or the horse or vice versa. So we get to really know who, what their goals are as a rider and what, horse, what this horse actually wants to do. And then we kind of go on that journey on rehoming and helping with that transition and making sure that the transition is smooth. And if they need any assistance, they can certainly reach back out. We work really closely with our integrity department, um, ensuring that if there's any welfare concerns or is there anything that we can assist with, the welfare farms are able to provide resources and support as, and being across with the stewards as well. So if we are needing to do anything in an emergency situation, we've got the properties to be able to support as and when that seeds fit. Mm. And how's Racing New South Wales connecting with the, the broader equestrian community? Obviously, it's a big part of it, isn't it? Having yeah. those contacts with the equestrian world. It is. We work really closely with our training academy. So we've got our training academy, which is a registered training organisation with their RTO. So we kind of double up, the welfare department go out with Training Academy to educate about equine welfare, attend expos, horse competitions, one to inspire and encourage thoroughbred ownership, but also to encourage careers in racing and get them on board. We found that there's such a shit synergy between a per person who owns a horse but wants to work in racing or someone who works in racing might want to eventually rehome a thoroughbred or want more support or resources and learn more about what they can do. Um, we've initially announced our Equimillion Equestrian event, which is kicking off uh, October long weekend at Sydney International Equestrian Centre. Uh, we're just working out the logistics now in terms of launching, and as you said, Caroline, our auction. We look to run a series of auctions over, which will join a bit of a calendar annually to then feed into one of the eligibility criteria for Equimillion. Equimillion will be a four discipline competition for year one. I don't know if we're ready for, for 10 disciplines, but we'll be looking at uh, dressage, show jumping, eventing, uh, and show horse. And as part of that, we've got a million dollar prize money. Uh, we're looking to distribute that to all abilities, being rider owner uh, and, and horse owner, uh, and really making sure that we're hitting grassroots level. I think one of the main key, key things for us is this prize money is distributed to the people who love the horse, who do so much work with them, uh, and gives them some money in their pocket to do more and, and hopefully have some more horses in their care as well. Oh, fantastic, Latoya. Good to hear some tweaks with Equimillion and, and, you know, to em encompass, you know, as many of the people that are taking the horses on as possible and the auction will be very exciting too. So looking forward to more details of that. Thanks, Latoya. We move on. Uh, Dr David Craig, of course, uh, from the Emirates Racing Authority. Um, it's such a fascinating jurisdiction, isn't it, that you're involved with. But how long has the retirement project in Dubai been operational? Well, interestingly enough, Dubai being, well, the UAE being a relatively new racing jurisdiction, it's younger than I am, um, which is very young as you can imagine. Um, the need for post care, like after care of horses has been recognized from that very start. So His Highness was aware of that from the outset. So he has sponsored that from, from the time that racing started. So we've got a facility now, it's been renamed as Dar al Kail, which is um, Arabic for home of the horse. And the facility currently has around um, 70 horses there, which is in the centre of Dubai. We have a steering committee in place now. Diana Cooper um, from Godolphin is part of it. Myself from the Emirates Racing Authority. And then the Dubai Racing Club is also involved there. So all under the patronage of His Highness. But it's been recognised from that real outset of racing in the UAE. Um, I think over 500 horses have been rehomed throughout that time. There are thoroughbreds competing in the UE polo team. There are horses competing, uh, there are horses working as lead ponies on race day. So it's really nice to see them all around the place and, and, and really having successful second careers. It's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, we know obviously in Australia and a lot of other parts of the world that so much of, uh, you know, the way racing is run comes down to the wagering dollar mm. and that is what supports so much. But obviously there's no gambling. So yeah. who actually is, is supporting the retirement program, yeah. given well, there's no gambling levy at all? Yeah, with no gambling levy, it is a really unique proposition to maintain racing and the prize money that is on offer in the UE because it's obviously very competitive. So it's actually... Um, 
entirely down to the generosity of the royal family. His Highness Sheikh Mohammed um, basically supports the whole operation down to the fact that subsidised veterinary care, all the laboratory care will be subsidised, all the care that we will give to those horses is all done free of charge. The horses are all looked after the highest standard. They've got a wonderful team in place um, looking after those horses you know, during the summer when it's unbelievably hot, getting up at ungodly hours to exercise the horses in the morning when things are cooler and, and really just giving them the best possible life. You've got some horses there 28, 29 years old that are still enjoying their retirement. You've got horses that are out doing things. And also when the horses are leased out, you know, if at any stage the people who have leased them are unable to look after them, they're always welcome to come back. There'll, there'll always be a place for them. There'll always be a home for them at Darrell Kale, which is really pretty impressive. Absolutely. And, and obviously there are some pretty um, different sort of climatic um, things that, that are involved in rehoming horses. It's not as if you had the green rolling hills of England or Ireland or New Zealand, Australia. Mm. So, so what are some of, some of those issues you have to deal with with the harsher climate? Well, as we all know, thoroughbreds in particular are pretty spectacular animals. So they're so adaptable and they really cope with things pretty well. But obviously in the summer in Dubai, heat's getting up to kind of 50 degrees Celsius. You're going to have a huge amount of humidity. So I think it is really down to the, the support of the team that's there that are able to look after them during those times of the year. So as I said, getting up in the middle of the night to exercise them, you know, air conditioning is in place. We have fully air conditioned stables, making sure, obviously you have increased fly burdens at that time. You're making sure that all those things are taken care of. Um, it's, it's really just a, a huge team effort that makes everything work for these horses. Oh, fascinating. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, just to round out the, the industry panel, of course, uh, Tim, when we were talking about, um, you know, the issue of, um, you know, the, the Magic Millions protesters, or they might be outside the Melbourne Cup, is, I mean, are we doing enough to actually be able to counter some of the aggression, you know, towards the racing industry and, and you know, the perceptions that, that the industry is not doing enough? I mean, what, what more can we do to really tackle? Because it is, you know, it is a broader issue than just the protesters, but it really is an attack on, on the, the very fabric of racing. I think there's always more to do, Caroline. There's always more to do. There's always more in messaging. There's always more pragmatic things that can be done. And I don't want to be alarmist, but the threat is real. It's, it is real. It's a serious, serious issue, and it needs to be addressed in that way. And it's so encouraging to see so many people here represented across so many boundaries from so many different parts of the world. But everyone here needs to go back, and I'm, you know, I'm almost preaching to the converted, but go back and put this subject up front and centre if it's not already there and put it in bigger lights if it needs to be. Because 2023 is a different place. It's a different place. Things happen quickly. Momentum grows quickly. We mentioned before activism and protest or the anti-racing brigade, as you mentioned. It is a cult, it's a religion, it's, you know, people get involved and sometimes and often they don't know why, but they just get involved and they've got big voices and they, they, they spew it out on social media. So I think it's really important that everyone stays on the front foot, not only because it's the right thing to do, but the prosperity of the industry as a whole it's hand in glove, isn't it? It really is. So, um, but, but finishing on a positive, the, the most positive thing is that people are doing things. We are getting better. The message is being told better. And just by the amount of people in this room, in contrast to years gone by, I was having a chat on the phone with Ellie the other day and, and to watch it go from the acorn to the oak tree. And it just needs to keep going in that direction. Well said indeed. All right, that wraps up our industry panel. We do have another few keynote speakers coming up after a short coffee break and, of course, then the equestrian panel as well. But time to just stretch your legs, uh, have a bit of a wander around and a bit of a chat and we'll be back. I think we have about 10 minutes for the break. Please thank our industry panel this afternoon.